But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Listening to the Alchemical Tech Revolution, and I am your host, Wayne McCroy. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, the role of eugenics in mass psychology. You know it's there. Underlying many of the agendas of today's world is always eugenics, and we're going to get into it tonight. How it's at the core of our modern psychology, and especially mass psychology. And tonight, we'll be looking into a lesser-known book by the late Jim Keith. This one's called Mass Control, Engineering Human Consciousness. And this is a fantastic, fantastic book. If you wanted to pick it up, it gives you a great breakdown as to some of the documented programs of mind control that have gone on. Things like MK Ultra and what the Nazi scientists were working on with mind control and all the rest, even right on up into... Some of the more modern era of these things with the Monarch program. Of course, Jim Keith died sometime in the late 1990s. And this is the legacy he left behind. He did a lot of books talking about mind control agendas. And he was well-researched, backed up what he said with documented facts, and we have some of his writings now today. And we'll see how this crosses the bounds of medicine into the borderlands of the mind. That's what it's all about. It's about control. That is the whole purpose of not only mass psychology, but also eugenics. It's about control. Controlling who gets to stay and who doesn't? You see, these were some lofty ideas. And of course, the idea of eugenics is far older than just the 20th century, as most people think of it. Eugenics dates back a very, very long time. In fact, in Plato's Republic, a very similar notion is brought to the forefront of thinking in the Greek pantheon. In the Greek philosophers, in their realms of thinking. So these ideas have transcended through time and culture and have actually taken a greater hold in the second half of the 1800s. That's when we saw an awful lot happening in this world. If you want to look under the hood of the occult context of much of what's been built in our modern world, what's become accepted science in our modern world, it derives back to some of these older ideas, but they put a new spin on it during that era of scientific revolution, during the Industrial Revolution. And they've taken these ideas and run with them, and of course... They've also manipulated these ideas in certain directions and applied their intentions to them 
in certain directions, and we have what we have today. And out of this was birthed eugenics. And with eugenics, the notion of Darwinian evolution, and we've talked about that here in the past as well. You see, they took the old spiritual idea of evolution, they inverted it and turned it on its head and turned it into something that is more on par with what they would consider a physical process in the material world. And they applied this, and the reason it was applied in that way was directly because of this eugenics idea. You see, Sir Francis Galton, the man who coined the phrase eugenics, he was a cousin of Charles Darwin, and Darwin admired his work very much. And in fact, if you look at what the subtitle of Darwin's book on evolution, the original one that he published, what the subtitle in it talks about, it talks about races. There's racial undertones to the idea that some races of humanity are more evolved than others, and that's, of course, based directly on these eugenics ideas. And most people don't even know about that. They don't have the first clue. Most people probably haven't even heard of Sir Francis Galton, let alone eugenics, but it had a major role in 20th century culture. Many people are largely unaware of that, too. They don't teach you these things in the textbooks. They don't teach you these things in school. You need to go and look and research things for yourself in order to find this kind of thing. Of course, you're taught about Darwinian evolution in school, and they teach it as if it's absolute fact, when in fact there are so many holes in the theory that it just doesn't even stand up to common sense and logic. But still, they prop it up with claims of evidences that really aren't there to support this grand notion that they've come up with. And it's taken on the basis of faith by those today who believe in and trust the science. That's what it's about. It's about getting people to buy into an ideology. And once they've bought into that ideology, to keep them chomping at the bit for it, and to put their trust and faith in this, this thing, this new thing they've adopted, this new god of the era, which they call science, the god of materialism, of the physical world, science, in the new age. And they've outright taken this idea as the new god of this new age. Of course, they don't think of it in those terms, in the secularized terms that they're handed, but certainly that's what this is. But at the heart of all of it lies this eugenics push. And what's eugenics about? Well, it's about not only depopulation, but it's about sifting through those that you find to be undesirable and getting rid of them out of the population. And most people are largely unaware that this notion undergirds our politics even today. And that a lot of it is a mockery in the public spaces. You see, they take organizations that sound really nice, like Planned Parenthood, and they use these as fronts to push eugenics based policies and ideas. That's why you will find predominantly pr Planned Parenthood clinics predominantly in black and Hispanic neighborhoods. Now, that's not my opinion, folks. That's an absolute fact. And there's a reason for that, because you see Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, was very much a very racist individual. She had very poor opinions of black people in particular. And she's even been quoted as talking about exterminating them like weeds. Just as a paraphrase, and 
like I said, this is not my opinion. This is not me saying things. These are documented facts. That's who Margaret Sanger was. And at the core of Planned Parenthood was these eugenics-based ideas, all based in this Darwinian evolution nonsense that grew up around it. And they seem to think it has to do with mental hygiene as much as anything else, and that's where we'll see the crossover here into eugenics in mass psychology. But without further ado, let's get into the reading. Agents of the world's elite have long been engaged in a war on the populace of Earth. Greed is the motivation for this war, a greed so pervasive that it encompasses the entire planet or plane and all of its beings on it. But in recent times, a philosophy has been used to justify that greed. It is the philosophy of mass control that ultimately aims to dictate every aspect of human life, even remolding man's perception of reality and himself. And I'm going to pause for a moment here. We've talked about this before. It's about changing the image of man in his own perception and therefore changing his entire reality as a result. Let's continue. Although the lust for control can be discerned since the beginning of recorded history, a nexus of particular importance arose in Germany in the latter half of the 19th century, as the country increased in military and industrial might, becoming the strongest power in Europe, a revolution simultaneously took place in German philosophic and scientific thought that paradoxically would spread through the world to create positive technological change as well as to birth innumerable toxic children. According to one source, quote, the sudden change from relative political weakness to world power and from economic insecurity to prosperity proved to be a great strain on the German character in public life. The spread of materialistic philosophy of life was worldwide in this age, and the idolatry of power was not confined to Germany, but its corrosive effect was particularly strong in a country that was not inured to power. End quote. And that's attributed to Encyclopedia Americana, New York, in an article titled Germany, History Since 1850, published in 1963. So we see here, Germany was one of the central repositories for some of these new ideologies taking hold. As I said, this was a very transformative era in the world on the world stage. The mid to late 1800s, this is wherein we saw a massive shift in social consciousness. And it all based around some of these ideas that they presented as science. Let's read on. One aspect of this transformation, this idolatry of power, was a negative transformation of the psychological sciences. In the late 19th century, earlier, more humanistic approaches to understanding mankind were replaced by a scientific philosophy that would be employed less as a measure for the understanding of man than as a justification for a new feudalism and a mechanism of pure control. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. Pay very close attention. This could not be any more true. You see, there was a grand shift in this approach to understanding mankind from a more philosophical or religious perspective to a scientific perspective. And the whole purpose for this was not so much to understand one's fellow human being or to relate better to one's fellow human being, but it was about developing a mechanism for control. Are the dots beginning to connect yet? Let's continue. The materialist overhauling of psychology was in great part ushered in by the work of the German psychologist Wilhelm Maximilian Wundt. 
Wundt was a professor of philosophy at the University of Leipzig, and in 1875 established the world's first psychological laboratory there, a move that would eventually turn the world of more humanistic-oriented psychology on its head. Interesting, but Wundt's grandfather is documented as having been a member of the Illuminati Secret Society, making it not unreasonable to imagine that Air Professor may also have been a member of that group. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. Yes, once grandfather was a member of the Bavarian Illuminati, recorded in the historical record in mainstream history, so is it possible his grandson could have carried on the tradition? That's often what happens. Sometimes families get involved in secret society groups, and the tradition passes on and on and on down through the lineage. Not saying that Wundt was definitely a member of the Illuminati, was most likely a member of some secret society group, though. And we'll see as we continue on here. There's always these types of connections with a lot of this stuff. But it was about establishing physical cause and effect relationships in behavior, in human behavior, and developing control mechanisms as a result. That's what the intention was here, and that's what was developed at this time. Let's continue. Wundt, in reflection of a powerful materialistic groundswell in German thought that began with Schopenhauer at the beginning of the 19th century, and that was to be later epitomized by Karl Marx, he rejected in cavalier fashion the notion that man might have a soul or deeper significance than the merely physical, that he was in fact anything more than an animal. I'm gonna pause for a moment here, folks. So here's where they throw out the notion of the spirit or the soul or anything beyond this physical, material world in which we exist. This is what they've indoctrinated much of the practitioners of modern-day psychology with is this type of notion. All of these things can be explained away in a physical, material world cause and effect sequence and might have something to do with physiology rather than encompassing, say, something spiritual. Any type of spiritual involvement in things. Gotta wonder. You gotta wonder what was lost from some of the older ways of thinking and applying study towards human psychology. But let's go ahead, we'll continue on here. Following this line of reasoning, an approach that came to be known as psychology, or known in psychology as structuralism, Wundt insisted that all psychological studies should depend entirely on the study of body reactions. The truth of man, Wundt insisted, could be determined solely through mechanistic means, measurement, analysis, and dissection of bodies. After Wundt had thoroughly infused the psychological sciences with his materialist approach, many scientists and the members of the ruling class that employed them believed that they were justified in treating human beings as if they were pieces of meat, and as an overall plan of action proceeded to do so. And I'm going to pause again there. I know I'm pausing a lot. But it seems like some of these ideas need to be expounded on. So you see, it's all about the quantification of behaviors, being able to observe and measure and quantify these things. And in so doing, like I've always told you, if you've listened long enough, when you are able to quantify a thing that gives you some measure of control over that thing, even if it's an imprecise measure of control, it can get generalized effects through the use of those measurements and being able to alter those measurements in certain ways. This is what they were doing. They were devising a control mechanism. As it says here, so even if it is not completely accurate, 
it does give them some modicum of control. It could give them some kind of generalized effects they can bring about through the use of these various mechanisms and through this approach that they've taken. But let's continue on. The materialist psychological doctrine spread rapidly with at least 24 laboratories established by once students between the years 1883 and 1893, with more of the Germans' acolytes fanning out to infiltrate related fields such as, get this, education. Once materialist materialistic, excuse me, once materialistic approach would infect the thinking of most of the influential psychologists, psychiatrists, educators, and social planners who would follow in the 20th century. One man who marched to once dirge was the Russian Ivan Petrovich Pavlov. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. You've probably heard of Pavlov and Pavlov's famous dog whom he made salivate by ringing a bell. You've probably heard that name. You probably haven't heard of Wundt. Maybe you have, but probably not. But Pavlov you've heard of, because this has to do with something called operant conditioning. But we'll get there. Pavlov conducted a wide-ranging research into techniques of control, primarily using dogs for his experimentation. In the now-famous experiment, Pavlov fed his dogs, stimulating salivation, while at the same time ringing a bell. After doing this many times, Pavlov was able to stimulate salivation in reaction to the sound of the bell alone. Other of Pavlov's experiments involved rewarding dogs with petting or punishing them with pain. Using these kinds of approaches, Pavlov developed his theory of the conditioned reflex, demonstrating that animals are motivated by patterns of conditioned response and that conditioning can be artificially induced. The result of Pavlov's experiments did not escape the social planners of his day, nor those who would follow. Gonna pause for a moment there. Like I said, this is the foundation of something called operant conditioning. This is a hugely important thing in the world of psychology, and human beings can be affected by it, very much so just like animals. And this harkens back to another concept we probably won't get much into here tonight, but was also used as a control mechanism, and that would be this Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You see, you have this certain hierarchy of needs, and if your basic survival needs, physical survival needs, are not met first, then many of these other things take a backseat. So if you are in survival mode, i.e. flight or fight response all the time, your critical thinking shuts down, and you don't plan well. You just react you don't act, you react. You become a reactive individual. You become a slave to this reactive state. So you will do those things just to survive. And this has been taken advantage of by the social controllers for a very long time. I don't think we're going to get too much into that here tonight. But just wanted to put that out there. Because they utilize these different concepts in psychology to steer the behaviors of the masses, and some of the ways they do so are more subtle than others. But at the end of the day, it's all about control. That's what they developed psychology for, is control. And a major portion of this was all about eugenics, as we'll see. Let's get back to it here. A time-honored approach to the manipulation of mankind is through the philosophy and techniques of eugenics. This is the attempted perfecting of humanity through genetic means, selective breeding, sterilization, biological manipulation, and even murder for those considered unfit. The study of eugenics has its beginnings in Germany sometime after the mid-19th century mark, stimulated by Volkish concerns for Aryan racial purity. 
Rudolf Virchow, pathologist and politician, began a study of national ethnic statistics in 1871, convinced that the majority of Germans would prove to be of relatively pure Nordic descent. The results of his studies proved otherwise. According to Virchow, the obvious solution was to set about Nordicizing the debased German stock. The popularity of eugenics theories was given a jump start in England by Sir Francis Galton, a cousin of Charles Darwin. In 1869, Galton published his book, Hereditary Genius, that Cornell University anthropology professor David Greenwood has called, quote, an impassioned brief for hereditary aristocracy that became the first modern document of the modern eugenics movement, end quote. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So, of course, it was always about identifying the ruling class and identifying the underclass. You see this division made very clearly right in Galton's book here, as described by Greenwood. Let's continue, though. Galton was the man who launched the nature versus nurture debate that quietly rages today arguing for the domination of innate rather than acquired human abilities. It was Galton's opinion that the human race could be improved by selective breeding and the extermination of the unfit. Galton once said that he hoped that eugenics would become, quote, the religion of the future, end quote. And I'm going to pause for a moment right there, folks. I think Galton is getting his wish. You see, where we are headed in this world today is directly into an ideology called transhumanism. And pro-transhumanists out there have described transhumanism in their own words as, quote, eugenics without coercion, end quote. So I think Galton may be on the verge of getting his wish fulfilled here. Just as a little aside, this may be the religion of the future, transhumanism. Eugenics without coercion. In the latter part of the century, with endeavors like the Human Genome Project that seek to map the entirety of the human DNA, his hope seems to be moving toward fulfillment. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Remember... Jim Keith passed away sometime in the late 1990s. And he was writing this back then. He saw the writing on the wall. And of course, it always leans directly towards this transhumanist push. I don't think it was recognized as a thing as much back then in the 1990s, but certainly today, we see it. It's coming wasn't talked about much in the 1990s. You'd be hard-pressed in the 1990s to find somebody who had even heard of a philosophy called transhumanism. It's difficult today. Most people don't have a friggin' clue. It's, it's very hard for me to relate to people in my regular everyday circles here in the world in which we live in. For instance... I go to church on Sundays and sometimes Wednesday nights, and sometimes I'll run into people there. And I'll, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm I'm an author and a broadcaster. Oh, well, what do you talk about? Mostly transhumanism, I tell them, and they're like, "What's that?" So I ask them, "Have you ever heard of transhumanism?" No, never heard of it. And most of the time, their eyes begin to glaze over when I try to explain what it is. And they find an excuse to wander away. So uh, I have a hard time relating to people in that regard. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's even difficult in the modern era, in today's time, to find people who understand what transhumanism is or have even heard of it. Now, if you mention some popular TV shows like Black Mirror, then sometimes people will be, oh, oh, yeah, I know. I know what you're saying about that stuff. But see, the problem is they all think it's just a work of fiction. They don't realize that it's predictive programming and that it's put there to influence their mind and their behaviors 
and to program them into the acceptance of this. And then they act all shocked and surprised when Elon Musk, now all of a sudden, has successfully implanted a brain chip in somebody for the first time with his Neuralink device. They act all shocked. Oh. Oh, they, they see that, and then all of a sudden, maybe they begin to think about the implications a little bit. Most of the time, not, though. <laughs> and that's the problem. Much of society is distracted with things of no real importance all the time, so it's hard to get them to focus on an important topic like that. Especially if you have to go into a two-hour diatribe as to what it is that you're trying to talk to them about. That's the problem I have. Oh, what, what, what are your books about? Transhumanism. Oh, what's that? Well, it would take me an awful long time to explain to you what it is. If you're completely and wholly in the dark about all of it, and most people are. So they don't understand, and they don't understand the spiritual implications of it either. Because they don't even understand what it is, even in the strictest definition. Have never heard of it. So it makes conversations difficult, let's put it that way. And I can't talk about sports and nonsensical things like that because I just don't I just don't follow those. I used to watch football occasionally. But I don't even do that anymore, and that's another thing on my last broadcast I did talking about the superb owl game coming up here. I made a couple mistakes which I will publicly correct here tonight. I said it was the 2022 Super Bowl that the Chargers won that. Well, I was incorrect. It wasn't the Chargers. It was the Rams. And that should have stuck out like a sore thumb to me because the Ram, of course, is a symbol representing Ares, the god of war, and that's the year that the Ukraine debacle kicked off right after the Super Bowl with the colors, the yellow and the blue. But somehow I missed that because I just don't follow football that closely. <laughs> so, And that's, that's one of the corrections. So I'm making that correction here on air tonight because I do like to be as accurate as possible. Another mistake I made, actually, and this one I find hugely interesting. I referred to Las Vegas as being Spanish for the stars. Well, that's not correct, and that was never correct. Well, here's the thing, folks. Las Vegas allegedly means the Meadows. Now, that kind of doesn't make sense, considering that Las Vegas is located in the middle of a desert. But okay, I can accept that. And I did. I went and I looked when somebody had corrected me in the comments under one of my, my videos about this. About that. And sure enough, that's what it means. And Las Vegas has never meant the stars Estrellas, I know, is the word for stars in Spanish, but here's the thing. I took four years of Spanish in school, and I could have sworn that Estrellas and Vegas were both words for stars in Spanish. And I know Vega is the name of a major star. So I don't know, is this a Mandela effect or some such thing? Or am I just really misremembering this and I totally got it wrong? I could accept either way. Does anybody else out there remember Las Vegas being told at one point Las Vegas means the stars? Or am I the only one that remembers that? Or misremembers that, if that's the case. But I find it interesting that they have a giant star on the top of their stein <laughs> going into Las Vegas and that they have a walk of the stars in Las Vegas. So there's some connection there, I would say, either way. But I just wanted to put those corrections on the public record while I'm thinking about it here. Not to get too far off topic. But of course, we have all of this, this stuff influencing our behaviors in a lot of ways. Even right down to the names of various cities and locations. It has an impact on the human psyche. You relate those locations to some different symbols, much like I just related Las Vegas to the stars for some reason. Even though it has nothing to do with the name of the town, 
allegedly, ostensibly here. But I, dig I digress on that point. Let's get back to this. The whole point here is eugenics is at the core of much of these manipulations of the human psyche because they try to base it in a physiological type basis. And this had begun in earnest with want and many of his acolytes that came later. And of course, then you throw in Charles Darwin and Sir Francis Galton, and they actually invent a science called eugenics based upon these ideas. And of course, psychology is interwoven with the eugenics science. Let's read on here. Galton's theories were influenced in part by his examination of the family trees of eminent stuffed shirts in England. He noted that most persons of accomplishment were related to each other. An aristocratic theory of intelligence, thus theoretically putting the aristocracy on a genetic pedestal and rationalizing a stratified society or caste system in Britain and the world. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So what is the true application of eugenics? It's to create this class divide. That's what it was for. It was to identify the ones that they saw as being the elites, the elite family bloodlines, and those being the lesser bloodlines that would fall somewhere lower in the caste system, this stratified society, identifying some physical notion, physiological notion, that can be used to identify the ruling class and divide them from the underclass even the name of the subject betrays something of its orientation. Galton derived the word eugenics from the Greek eugenies, meaning well-born. This aggrandizement of the privileged class was one of the reasons why eugenics research found ready support from the moneyed in both America and Europe. It justified their disdain for, for and their parasitism of the masses. going to pause for a moment here, folks. So the people with the money, they found this idea attractive. Oh, there's a reason why we're better than the rest of those people. You see how the whole idea stroked their egos all the more. Flattery being one of the key components of mind control in many regards. Flattery. That's one of the big keys to controlling people. You flatter them. And of course, many in the upper crust had fallen for this, and they put their monies in the pot to fund the research further because it gave them, gave them something they found attractive gave them justification for treating people of a lower social status like crap, as lesser beings. And for some reason, they liked this. They liked the feeling of superiority over others and having some actual physical proof that they were superior. So of course they funded this. Let's get back into this, though. Chairs in eugenics and eugenics in working society were established at the University College in London in 1904, with the Galton Laboratory for National Eugenics founded in 1907. In 1905, in the United States, the Rockefellers and Carnegies constructed the Eugenics Records Office at Cold Springs Harbor, New York, where genetic research, none dare call it eugenics, is still being done in 1999. going to pause for a moment here, folks. I don't know if they're still doing, quote-unquote, genetics research there or not. I assume they probably are because, you see, organizations like the Population Council still exist. That's right. The United States has a Population Council. Did you know that? We have these organizations that were put in place basically to deal with the project 
well, not the project, to deal with the prospect of overpopulation and of reducing the numbers of the ones that they determine to be undesirables. There's a lot to this and a lot of social engineering strategies that have gone into this through the years, as we'll see. But let's get back to the reading here, because this is laying down the foundations and giving us the history of how eugenics and psychology are intertwined together and how they took hold and were adopted here in the late 19th and early 20th, early 20th centuries. In 1912, the first International Congress of Eugenics was convened at the University of London, presided over by its president, who also happened to be Charles Darwin's son. Vice presidents of the Congress included the first Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, M. von Gruber, Professor of Hygiene at Munich University, Dr. Alfred Plotz, President of the International Society for Race Hygiene, Charles W. Eliot, President Emeritus of Harvard, and the inventor of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. That's right, all these people were eugenicists. Winston Churchill was a eugenicist. Alexander Graham Bell was a eugenicist. And the others, of course. Let's continue. The Second International Congress of Eugenics was held in 1921, sponsored by U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, and the presidents of Clark University, Smith College, and the Carnegie Institution. Other prominent supporters of eugenics of the period, who will loom large in the history of control to follow, included many members of the American Eastern Establishment, particularly of the Eastern Establishment Dulles and Harriman families. Gonna pause for a moment, folks. You may have heard the name John Dulles. You may have heard of the Dulles brothers. The ones who worked in the CIA. Helped to bring the CIA to prominence. Were involved in the intelligence community. And, of course, they've got, I believe, airports and things like that named after them now. The Dulles Brothers. Anyway, let's continue reading here. Harriman, you've probably heard that name, too. If you haven't, that's a very wealthy and influential family here in the Americas. From 1907 to 1960, more than 100,000 persons were eugenically sterilized in over 30 states in the United States. It is unlikely that the well-known and horrific Nazi approach to eugenics, brutally carried out in laboratories and concentration camps during World War II, and repeatedly claiming hundreds of thousands of victims, would have taken place without eugenics theory having been earlier popularized by British and American scientists and media, and funded by American and British money interest. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So now we have this connection to... The Nazi atrocities, of course, which were based in these eugenics ideas. And there may be holes in some of the stories that we hear about what exactly happened with these Nazi interests. But make no mistake, they adopted their programs from American and British programs. Let's continue on here. German eugenic studies were organized and bankrolled by the family-run Rockefeller Foundation and its allies in medicine, industry, and politics, with large grants provided to the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Psychiatry and the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Anthropology, Eugenics, and Human Heredity in Munich. The latter facility was run by the fascist Swiss psychiatrist Ernst Rudin and his underlings Otmar Verschauer and Franz Kallmann. In 1932, Ernst Rudin was named president of the Worldwide Eugenics Federation. Rockefeller funding for eugenics research in Germany would continue during World War II, the stated justification being that the war should not impede scientific research. I'm going to pause for another mo moment here, folks. If you've never heard of Ernst Rudin, you need to look that guy up. He was a scumbag of a higher order. 
Let's put it that way. But let's continue on here. The Kaiser Wilhelm Institute's eugenic studies were initially endowed by Gustav Krupp von Bolin and Halbuck. The head of the Krupp munitions monolith and James Loeb of the Kuhn Loeb banking family. Loeb's relatives, the Warburgs, were banking partners of William Rockefeller, and both families were responsible for setting up the American Harriman family, also movers and shakers in eugenics in business. I'm going to pause again. So we have some very famous family bloodlines coming into play here. Krupp. Loeb of the Kuhn Loeb banking family, related to the Warburgs, related to the Rockefellers, and the Harrimans, and they set up shop in Western society. And these are the people who largely funded eugenics research, both in Germany and the United States and Britain, all these various places in the world. And these programs were adopted. And, of course, we know the mainstream story we get about the Nazis and the atrocities that they carried out. And of course, this is what comes to fruition when you utilize eugenics policies. Let's put it that way. Although we know little about what took place in German laboratories researching mind control and brainwashing during this period, there are some hints. In 1933, the Ger German Reichstag building was burned. In the time-honored tradition of the Patsy, a Dutchman, a mental patient named Marinus van der Lubbe, was arrested and charged with the crime. Psychiatric reports called van der Lubbe an unstable but happy man who lived as a vagabond and entertained notions of changing the world. In court, however, van der Lubbe seemed nothing of the sort, appearing almost completely apathetic, responding dully to questions going to pause for a moment here, folks. The Reichstag building was burned, and of course it was burned because that's the hallmark. The fingerprint of the philosophers of fire. So there were, in my estimation, occult ties to this as well. But 1933, that's when the Reichstag building was burned, and they assigned a patsy the blame for this. A Dutchman named Marinus van der Lubbe on the 42nd day of the trial, van der Lubbe suddenly made a remarkable change. Now he began excitedly talking about inner voices that commanded him. He demanded that he be put to death, and then just as suddenly slumped back into apathy. Van der Lubbe was convicted by the court and executed. Subsequent events made it clear, however, that it was members of the Nazi party itself who had burned the Reichstag. It is not outside the realm of possibility that van der Lubbe had been brainwashed to take the fall, as many other patsies have been programmed to do it in the years that have ensued. going to pause for a moment here, folks. So we still have this concept or notion that happens today surrounding some of these major events, especially highly politicized events, where people take the fall and oftentimes they're psychiatric patients. And they take the fall or the blame for some such thing, when in fact it probably wasn't them that had done so. And of course we always see intelligence community ties with much of this. And this shows an early example of that happening in Nazi Germany. I think this was actually prior to the rise to power of the Nazis, though. But that's neither here nor there. So this guy was set up. He took the fall. And of course, history proves that it was actually members of the Nazi party that set the fire. But we didn't find that out until much later. Let's go ahead and read on here. After Hitler took control in Germany, Rudin, Ernst Rudin's organization was internalized as part of the Nazi political machine. Rudin was appointed head of the Nazi Racial Hygiene Society, and he and his staff, joining the Task Force on Heredity, chaired by Himmler, the group that was, no, was to institute the infamous Nazi sterilization laws. 
One of Rudin's employees was Joseph Mengele, also known as the Angel of Death, who was to become the medical commandant of Auschwitz and perform his own horrific experimentation upon inmates of the camp. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. Now, this guy, Mengele, was a true monster. This guy was also a scumbag of a higher order, much like Ernst Rudin. And these guys had this firm foundational belief in eugenics theory. So this should tell you a little something about the mindset of eugenics. Let's read on here, though. In 1936, the direct predecessor of the CIA's more famous MK Ultra mind control operation was launched at the New York State Psychiatric Institute, funded by the Freemasonic Scottish Rite Northern Supreme Council and supervised by Dr. Nolan D.C. Lewis, the Masonic field representative of research on dementia praecox. The program was directed by Winfred Overholzer, a prominent Freemason and the superintendent of St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., where much CIA mind control experimentation would later take place. In 1943, Overholzer went on to become the chairman of the Truth Drug Committee for the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was the direct precursor of the CIA, ladies and gentlemen, and amongst the earliest mind control research programs instituted by American intelligence. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. Now you'll find there are the names of a lot of people who belonged to the Freemasonic fraternity here involved as well. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why these organizations get so many accusations levied at them, because it would seem that there's always these connections back to these secret society groups. And it's not all the members of the secret society groups that have blood on their hands with these types of things. But certainly, they utilize concepts from within the secret society groups to maintain secrecy around certain programs and to get things done. Let's put it that way. They deal with like-minded folks. They're fellow travelers. When they've taken all these blood oaths and sworn to help and protect one another, of course they work together to maintain the status quo and to perhaps keep any kind of atrocities from coming to the light of day. They've taken blood oaths, swearing allegiance to the fraternity and to help their fellow brothers in these fraternities. And I find it interesting they always seem to turn up, at least certain members of these fraternities, who get things done at the highest, most levels. And that doesn't reflect the vast majority in these groups. Your average Freemason doesn't know diddly squat about anything. Let's put it that way. Your average Freemason does not know what they're involved with and what things get done at the highest, most echelons of that secret society group and the things they're involved with and what actually is the power base behind it. And they would be probably shocked and appalled to learn those things, and they won't believe them if you tell them. Because, you see, these groups lie to their lower-level members. On record, admittedly, by themselves, in their own words, they won't tell them the truth. They're not straight with them. It's only when they get to the 30th degree or above in the Scottish Rite Freemasonry that they maybe let them in on some of the secrets or some of the inside jokes. But below that, they lie to them all the way up through the ladders of initiation. But that's neither here nor there. But I find it always interesting that these intelligence community operations and these different military operations like this, things like mind control research... All of these things have ties back to the secret society groups because these are the original groups that have done these things in the past. The secret societies. 
The intelligence community is just an offshoot of the secret societies. Were you aware of that? Where do you think they get their standards of operation from? Where do you think they get their their various methods and methodologies for doing things from? Well, it falls back to the secret society groups. This stuff's been recorded for centuries. There's centuries of stratagems recorded within the annals of the secret society groups of how they do things covertly and how they keep the secrets intact. And this is what the intelligence community has done. They've adopted these same techniques and they are nothing more than an offshoot of the secret society groups and that's why you will always find members of some of these secret society groups involved in some of the high-level planning of operations like this one that we're talking about here. But let's continue on. In 1936, Ernst Rudin's assistant, Dr. Franz Kalman, after being exposed in Germany as being half-Jewish, emigrated to America where he established the Medical Genetics Department of the New York State Psychiatric Institute, an operation also funded by the Scottish Rite. In the preface to his Masonic-funded study of schizophrenics, Kalman wrote that schizophrenics were a, quote, source of maladjusted crooks and the lowest types of criminal offenders. Even the faithful believers in liberty would be happier without those, end quote. And he also added, quote, I am reluctant to admit the necessity for different eugenics programs for democratic and fascistic communities. There are neither biological nor sociological differences between a democratic and a totalitarian schizophrenic, end quote. So I'm going to pause for a moment here. This was Kalman, this Dr. Kalman, one of Ernst Rudin's assistants, and you see the mentality of these people. They wanted to see a large portion of society weaned out of the gene pool. Let's put it that way. Let's continue, though. After World War II, Otmar Verschuer, who had procured funds for Mengele's experimentation at Auschwitz, was hired by the Rockefeller-funded Borough of Human Heredity in Denmark, and Rudin, Verschoer, and Kalman participated in founding the still-active American Society of Human Genetics. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So now, you should know something about genetics studies here in America. These were the people that founded the American Society of Human Genetics. Ernst Rudin, Verschuer, and Kalman. So you know the intentions in genetics research from the outset here. It's all based in eugenics, folks. Kalman was elected director of the organization and would hold that position until 1965. The American Society of Human Genetics is primarily responsible for the current, then current, but during the writing of this book, $3 billion human genome project headquartered at Cold Springs Harbor, the historical center of American eugenic study that is the forefront of the news today. The relation of eugenics to British psychiatry bears examination. The primary controlling body for psychiatry in England is the British National Association for Mental Health, formed in 1944 and initially run by the mentally un stable Montague Norman, previously of the Bank of England. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. Montague Norman, if you haven't heard of this guy, you definitely need to look this fellow up. And this is where the rubber meets the road with some of this. This guy was involved in the British National Association for Mental Health. He was also involved with the Bank of England, and he was a major banker who pretty much told you the banks are going to run everything. These people were a special kind of scumbags. So why do we have bankers involved in mental health? Think about that. But well, anyway, let's continue on. So 
The group originally met at Norman's London home, where he and Nazi economics minister Jalmer Schacht had met in the 1930s to arrange financing for Hitler. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So, bankers who funded Hitler, what are they doing involved in mental health here in the, in the United States and Great Britain? Because, believe me, this carried over to the United States, too. Not just Great Britain. We'll see. We'll get there. Let's read on. So, the British National Association for Mental Health is a renaming and public relations sanitization of the National Councils of Mental Hygiene, earlier one of the primary proponents for eugenics programs worldwide, and a group that broadly collaborated with Nazi eugenics practitioners prior to World War II. It can be seen that the current British psychiatric establishment proceeds in a direct line from the earlier eugenics establishment, much the same as the majority of the movers and shapers in American politics have come from eugenics proactive families. Going to pause there. We'll see. We'll get into the American side of this in a moment. But the British and the American are always interrelated yeah, they work very closely together with many of these projects. In 1948, the National Association for Mental Health joined forces with the United Nations and the Tavistock Institute, a long-term collaboration between British military intelligence and psychiatry. The National Association of Mental Health and Tavistock convened an international congress of mental health at the Ministry of Health in London. A World Federation of Mental Health was formed there to coordinate planetary psychological operations. The head of the World Federation was chosen, Brigadier General Dr. John Rawlings Reese, who was also the head of Tavistock. And I'm going to pause for a moment there, Rawlings Reese. Another special class of scumbag, if ever there was one. And if you want to learn more about him, we've done whole programs talking about the policies of Dr. John Rawlings Reese and about Tavistock. Go back and listen to some of the Tavistock episodes. Co-director was Frank Fremont Smith, the chief medical officer of the Macy Foundation, an organization that was later to be a primary funding source for the CIA's MK Ultra Mind Control projects. Going to pause for a moment here, folks, and also the founders of the Cybernetics Group. Cybernetics always involved. I've made the connections here before. The Cybernetics Group came from the Macy Foundation as well. And many of these same individuals were involved. Let's continue here, though. Vice presidents of the National Association of Mental Health included Tavistock psychiatrist and eugenics activist Professor Cyril Burt, Dr. Hugh Crichton Miller, a founder of Tavistock, psychiatrist Sir David Henderson, author of Psychiatry and Race Betterment, Lord Thomas Jeeves Horder, the president of the Eugenics Society of Great Britain, in the Family Planning Association, pro-Nazi psychiatrist Carl G. Young, who was also the psychiatrist for the Dulles family, Dr. Winfred Overholzer, representative of the Scottish Rite Masons, and Dr. Alfred Frank Treadgold of the British Ministry of Health's Committee on Sterilization. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So all of these big names are important here, and we'll see some of the crossover as we get through here a little later, but it's all based on foundational ideas of eugenics. And modern psychiatry is also founded on these same ideas as we can see here. But let's go ahead and we will continue with the reading here. Although eugenics organizations and activists sought deep cover after the defeat of Hitler, something of the stench of the death camps clinging to the subject, the same programs to weed out the inferiors from mankind, would continue with the same personnel or their successors in charge of the programs. 
Working out of the family offices of the Rockefellers in the United States, the Eugenics Society now metamorphized into the Society for the Study of Social Biology. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Social biology. Think about that. What in the world kind of a term is that? It's code. It's coded language. They didn't want to call it eugenics. <laughs> so they called it social biology. Because eugenics at this point has gotten a bad rap because of the Nazi association. But let's continue on here. Although it has been a carefully guarded secret by the watchdogs of the mainstream media, eugenics programs were never discontinued worldwide, with involuntary sterilization programs continuing in many countries to this day. Information has only recently surfaced that sterilization programs for those considered to be unfit because of genetics or behavior continued to exist in Scandinavia and in France until the 1970s. At the same time, massive involuntary sterilization programs continue to be implemented in the third world. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. And that is also something ongoing, and we've covered this before. And there are some big names involved in this, too, that have had a role to play in this policy that's been implemented. Notably, one Mr. Henry Kissinger was involved with this onset of these sterilization procedures and policies in third world countries. You see, it was called the Hague kissinger Plan. And I've actually done some work talking about that before in the past, too. All these things, they all seem to interrelate and connect, don't they? And it all has to do with depopulation. Depopulation. Let's continue here, though. Eugenics practice has continued in Australia, where more than 1,000 intellectually disabled women have been illegally sterilized since 1991. The Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission discovered that 1,043 sterilization operations, only 17 of them approved by the court, as mandated by Australian law, had been performed. The number of sup such operations may in fact have been several times as high, since only the operations performed using medical insurance were registered. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So we see, still to this day, we have... Much of this going on, and I've heard people actually argue for the sterilization of certain people, even in the modern era, and even in polite society. Some people will argue, well, these people should not be allowed to have any more children, on, in regards to some people. And they think they should be forced sterilized, and I don't think that's right, because that is a eugenics-based idea. Now... I don't know. I mean, oftentimes they will offer some social arguments as to their reasoning why, and a lot of people would seem to accept those notions as being valid or validated. But it's still not right, because that sets a dangerous precedent. Dangerous precedent. If they can do it to somebody else, they can do it to you. Remember that. And that is of the utmost importance with a lot of this. Let's read on here. In 1974, Federal District Court Judge Gerhard Gesell estimated that over the last few years, between 100,000 and 150,000 low-income persons had been sterilized under federally funded programs in the United States. Gesell stated an indefinite number of those sterilized were improperly coerced into accepting sterilization. So these things still go on today, folks. And sometimes they're official programs, and oftentimes they coerce people into taking these types of methods of birth control, I guess you could call it. They will coerce them into maybe getting their tubes tied or some such thing because they don't want these people to reproduce. And you see how this becomes very dangerous. So even if they're using coercion, it's still not really voluntary if you have to coerce somebody. And we see how it steps over the bounds. 
of various things in polite society here. But let's continue on. One of the prime target groups for sterilization in the United States has been the Native American population, according to Ruth Ann Evanoff in an article titled Reproductive Rights and Occupational Health, states that, quote, overall, at least 25% of the Native women of childbearing age have been sterilized, although the total population numbers less than 1 million. Recent reports estimate that the percentage sterilized in one tribe alone, the Northern Cheyenne, is 80%, end quote. An oft-cited justification for current eugenics practice is the elimination of violence in society. At this time, millions of dollars are being spent on research into the control of violence through genetic means. In 1992, a report was produced jointly by the National Academy of Sciences and the National Research Council titled Understanding and Preventing Violence. Among the groups funding the report were the Centers for Disease Control, the U.S. Justice Department, and the National Science Foundation. The report suggested that more studies should be done on, quote, biological and genetic factors in violent crime, end quote, and suggested that higher crime rates among black males might come from a genetic predisposition. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. This is your CDC. This is your National Science Foundation. This is your U.S. Justice Department. Made those claims, said those things in their studies and their sites, sightings for this, their reasonings. And then you wonder why they like to incite racial tensions here in America. Well, they have this attitude this ideology towards certain racial groups here. And they want to find out these genetic factors and quantify some genetic factor as to the escalation of crime, even if there's not one there. They want to try to find a way to quantify this so they can maybe figure out how to manipulate that. And you wonder why we still have these tensions in this day and age when really by rights there shouldn't be any of these tensions. But here we are, and it all ties back to these eugenics ideas because it, at the end of the day, what it's always about is you have one particular group of people who somehow thinks they're superior to another. And that is what causes this tension. It's more of a class divide than anything else, but if they can find some obvious physical trait that they could divide the, the population on, they will certainly try to do so. It's the old divide-and-conquer methodology at play. You want to keep the people infighting over things of no real importance. And in the meantime, you set up shop and you run your policies however you see fit, and do what you want to do that benefits you. That's how these elites in this world operate, these ones that perceive themselves as the elites. And, of course, they've come up with all these different sciences to justify their position, to try to validate their position and claim they are the elites, they are the ruling class, they are the ones who have the divine right to rule over the rest and that you need to listen to them because they are superior. That's what they've done and you see why it still gets funding because it's these people in the upper crust with the money and the power and the influence that stroke their own egos by coming up with these scientific types of studies to show how they're better than you to try to quantify ways in which they are better than you and think that they can control you using those methods those quantities that they come up with. It strokes their ego. And in the meantime, it also gives them a type of a mechanism to keep the masses in fighting with one another and distracted from the real problem. Let's continue here. In England, concerns are similar. The Department of Health has recently commissioned research into a delinquency gene called Fragile X. 
According to the London Sunday Times, it is believed by some scientists that one in every 259 women carry the defective Fragile X, which causes a lack of brain protein, resulting in antisocial behavior. Health officials are planning to engage in mass screening so that women can carry the defective gene, can be alerted and induced to abort their children. I'm going to pause for a moment. Now, this is a little dated. We haven't heard much about this Fragile X thing in recent years, but we have so many things, so many maladies in our culture today, and especially in our youth today. And many of these maladies have been manufactured by these very same people who push eugenics, psychology, physiology, all of these related disciplines. And they try to adapt strategies to quote-unquote treat these individuals. And oftentimes the treatments are worse than the maladies. We see this across the board with all of our medical system. Our medical system is massively broken at this point. And that's one of the major problems we have. And with this broken medical system, we have a broken mental health system as well. Why is it broken? Well, it's because they've taken these ideas and applied them into this new science that they called psychology. And at the heart of what lies at the core of psychology is eugenics ideologies. And because of these eugenics ideologies... They never come to actually treat or cure the underlying causes, which may or may not be something physical. They always perceive it as something physical, and it may not be something physical, or physiological would be the better term to use here. Sometimes that may be the case, and other times not. And it would appear to me that these times where something physiological is often the case or at the core of causation of some of these maladies that you would call mental illnesses or neurological conditions or some such thing, you'll find that these are oftentimes artificially induced through various environmental contaminants or other vectors. And they lead to some very real-world consequences for the people who suffer from these maladies. And oftentimes, the the only way to treat these, these artificially induced conditions, is by using some other artificial type of method or approach to getting back to this state of homeostasis within the physiological system. Now, this isn't always the case, but oftentimes, even if it's not the case, they engineer it into being that case, you see. And I hope I'm making sense when I'm saying this. Oftentimes, they will apply some set of symptoms. They'll look at that, and they'll claim that it's caused by such and such a cause a physiological cause. And then they will attempt to treat that physiological cause, whether it's truly present or not. And in so doing, they introduce a new physiological mechanism into play. And oftentimes this exacerbates things and makes them worse. And then things begin to spiral out of control, and oftentimes they begin to use some other type of mechanism to control the new erratic behaviors And people wind up on a cocktail of medicines that sometimes will help alleviate some of the symptoms or suffering. And other times they'll just make things worse. And they're never truly in balance. And it may not have actually been something physiological to begin with. There may be some spiritual aspect behind things that has not been dealt with. That is at the root of this. And of course our modern science denies anything spiritual. Anything spiritual being a causative factor. These same people 
who will tell you, no, there's no such thing as demons. Demons don't cause illness or disease. These same people who tell you that invisible thing that you perceive that demon is not real and cannot do that. But they will also tell you some other invisible thing like a virus can cause disease that cannot really be seen or dealt with in certain ways. So there's a logical disconnect. And I hope I don't sound like I'm rambling here because certainly these things are apropos and they do cross over in a lot of ways. You see, I'm of the mindset that it's not always some physical material world cause and effect sequence that causes everything wrong within especially the minds and emotions of people. It's not always that at all. There are spiritual things which can affect us. And our modern science does not acknowledge these, the existence of these things and does not want to deal with them. So it will apply some physiological mechanism as an explanation, and then they will try, tend to try to treat that physiological mechanism in certain ways to alleviate the problem. And oftentimes it doesn't alleviate the problem. Sometimes it will mask the problem, and other times it will exasperate the, the problem. That's where we're at in our modern psychology. And it's largely because it's based on these eugenics studies that have been done, wherein they were trying to link some physiological factor to the superiority of some races over others. This is in their view, okay? This is what they've put down in these studies, and that's most certainly what it is. Now, I'm not of the mindset that any race is superior to another or any person superior to another. But this is what is the foundational core of eugenics, and it is what's at the roots of modern psychology. And it's about developing this mechanism of control, because at the end of the day, that's what it's all been about. Control over people, control over the minds of people, over the behavior of people, and over who gets to stay and who has to go. That's what eugenics is about. You see, they identified who they thought were the undesirables, who were the underclass, and they set up some physiological criteria to determine this, and they set up these mechanisms through experimentation, oftentimes horrid experimentation. And they applied this towards mind control technologies, they applied this towards social control mechanisms, and they applied this, of course, to physiology and anatomy, and, of course, genetic sequencing, and all of these things that are born out of it are all to further attempt to fine-tune this control mechanism that they've been building. And as I led off with here earlier in the show, even, even if these methods and these machinations that they come up with in this physiological control system, even if they're very crude and they're not 100% accurate, if they're imprecise, they still give them some measure of control over a thing in that way. That's why they seek to quantify everything. By quantifying a thing, you can then begin to apply the key energy science mathematics to that thing as a mechanism of control, and that is most certainly what they do. That's why they're all about these physiological tests, these physical tests that they do and perform on people. They're looking for this mechanism in which they can control a thing. That's why they take measurements. That's why any type of a medical examination you go to, if you get blood work done, they're looking for certain factors in your blood, and they assign numbers to this. There's a reason they assign numbers, and they tell you this is the normal range. This is not the normal range. They'll tell you this is outside the normal range, so we need to give you this medication to bring that back into homeostasis. And, of course, I may have to do a breakdown on the whole science of homeostasis at some point here for you folks out there to better understand 
that's what it's all about. They found this notion of homeostasis, in, especially in the physiological system of human beings, as being of utmost importance to the development of these mechanisms of control. And this, once again, falls back on a couple concepts we spoke of earlier. But that's going to have to be a topic for another day. But at any rate, that's the whole point here. The reason why they have to measure and quantify everything because they want to control that thing and having some solid foundation of a type of way of counting and numbering it gives them a mechanism for control, even if it's imprecise. They can know if they're making an effect or not in that way. And oftentimes, the systems they develop, these machinations of control, these mechanisms of control, the foundation on which they're built is not accurate, but they still work to some degree. And they could apply some of these methods in that way. So even at the end of the day, if you accept there's a spiritual side to things, which I do, you still have to acknowledge that some of these physiological mechanisms they've put in play do have an effect, even if it's just a generalized effect on people. And that's the important thing to understand. So we know the motivations. We know the roots of it all. We know eugenics has played a massive role in the history of the 20th century and, of course, leading up into the 21st century now in its new iteration called transhumanism. It's going to play a massive role here in things to come. I think we're seeing that coming to fruition in front of our eyes. They decided to go ahead and unleash on the world certain mechanisms that will attempt to cull the growing population. And we're seeing that play out in front of our eyes. These are all based on these eugenics ideas, of course, as always, as is everything else. And they operate these things very covertly. It's not something that's talked about out in public, out in polite society at all. Not something that's acknowledged. But most certainly, we see these things happening in the world around us right now. So you got to be savvy. You really have to dig into things by yourself in order to have better understanding. You can't just take some expert's word on a thing. Don't take my word on a thing either. Go out and research. Look into what I'm telling you. And oftentimes, I'll tell you right where I'm citing this stuff from. You could go check it out yourself and go back to the sources that are given by even the sources I give. Research it back. Discern what's true and what's not true. And you'll begin to see deception runs deep in this world. And they have devised methods for controlling people that run very deep as well. That's the bottom line here. We've been so indoctrinated that we don't see it. A lot of the most educated people I know just don't see it. They've been so thoroughly indoctrinated into their field of expertise that they can't see the forest for the trees. Their way of thinking has been so compartmentalized they can't see the broader picture. They only see one small fraction of the picture, and they think because they've been taught this, they've been indoctrinated this, they think because they have this higher level of education in their specialty that somehow that makes them smarter or their opinion better than yours or more accurate than yours. So the higher the education level, the higher the indoctrination level it would seem to be in most cases. Most people who pursue higher education these days 
well, they wind up getting higher indoctrination, and it's very hard to stab that off at times. Especially when your job depends upon agreeing with what they call the quote-unquote consensus. Do you trust the science? Do you believe the science? Well, when the science isn't exactly what they told you it was, it becomes problematic. But still, if you like your paycheck, you go along with it. And we've seen so much of that in recent years, haven't we? And this is all part and parcel of what's been done here. At any rate, though, we see eugenics is foundational to not only the science of mass psychology, but it's at the core of our very medical system, our overall medical system today. It's all established on eugenics-based ideas, and this push towards genetics and epigenetics and these types of therapies they've developed, gene therapies of various sorts, mRNA technologies, all of these things are all based on these eugenics studies. Now, can they perhaps do some good things with some of this quote-unquote science? Certainly, I think it's possible the problem is it's the people who fund this and back this and push the policies and the agendas behind it and who fund the science and use the science. Their intentions aren't the best. Let's put it that way. So that's where it becomes problematic, and I think we need to keep a tighter rein on many of these new sciences that they've developed. You need to keep a close eye on these developments, especially things like Neuralink. And of course, Neuralink is just the public face of a technology that runs much deeper than Elon Musk's little company promoting it. That's the public face. There's other companies that have probably already gone much further than Elon Musk with this. And many of these programs were already developed 30 years ago within the auspices of the military-industrial complexes, special access programs, no doubt. So what we're seeing here is just the normalization process for some of these applications. And they always will talk about it in the best possible way, Oh, well, you see, it could help, perhaps, paralyzed people to be able to walk again. It can help in all these innumerable ways. And certainly, I mean, the potential's there, sure. But do you really think that's what the end game is? I think you're mistaken. That's not the end game. It's not for the benefit of mankind. It's for the benefit of a select few. And it's for the control of mankind. That's what these things have been researched and constructed for, especially when it comes to these cybernetic applications, much like this Neuralink project that has been getting some attention this past week. And Elon Musk, of course, is the poster boy for this He's got actor on his resume, folks. He appeared in Iron Man 2. <laughs> so I think that tells you everything you need to know about the guy. But anyway, that's, that's a, another story for another time. But the whole point here, if you take nothing else away from this tonight, what you need to remember is much of what we're handed in the medical community and in the psychological or mental health community that we have today the officialdom of mental health treatment and medical treatment. It's all based on eugenics policies and ideas. So when you understand that, a lot of other things begin to click into place for you and the dots begin to connect very thoroughly. When you realize that many of these treatments they've come up with are not intended for your overall good, but intended just as a mechanism to control you with, then you begin to better acclimate to what's going on with this stuff 
and psychology has been weaponized against the masses to enforce eugenics-based policies. And I think we've seen that demonstrated over the course of the past several years here. The way that the mass psychology of the people has been influenced. People's behaviors have changed. There's a palpable difference in the world, folks, since the onset of the scamdemic in 2020. There's a real, measurable, noticeable, palpable difference in how people interact with each other since that time. If you've been paying attention. This was all gamed against us in this way. And of course, it has everything to do with control and with eugenics as well. But anyway, folks, I want to thank you all for tuning in. That's all the time we have for tonight. I appreciate each and every one of you. We'll catch you next time. Have a good night now. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex.